Good morning and welcome to church. We're really excited that everybody's here. My name is Scott Hare. I get to be one of the pastors here. Just a, a few announcements to let you know everything that's going on. We are beginning Advent this week, uh, which is an exciting time in which we prepare our hearts uh, for God to come into the world, Emmanuel, through Jesus. And it's just a really powerful and beautiful thing. A few announcements so that you'll know them. The first is that we have uh, something that we call the angel tree. And the angel tree is uh, an ongoing tradition of the church here in which, like in many places, you sort of um, adopt a family or a kid that needs Christmas that might not be able to afford it. Well, this year's a little different. Usually we're able to kind of have some interaction and things like that. But due to our pandemic re, you know, restrictions, we're going to do that a little bit differently. So what we're actually doing is making financial donations. Uh, so what you can do is you can go onto the website. You can find the angel tree uh, piece where you give. Uh, I think we're asking people to give about $50 per family. I know that this actually works because we totally forgot about it until yesterday. And so we took care of this uh, yesterday when we got that really helpful reminder. I will need to tell you that we have many more families than we usually do. Uh, and so because of that, maybe you usually give to one, maybe two, maybe you pick up an extra one or two this year uh, as a way of taking care of some of these folks that are coming through. Lots of kids uh, trying to figure out and parents really trying to figure out how to have some Christmas with their families. And I would just really encourage you to take part in that. It's $50 and imagine how far $50 goes. Um, so let's be as generous as we can uh, and make sure that everybody gets Christmas. That's the angel tree. Uh, the next one is point Setas, although somebody said poinsettia this week, so I don't know if it's poinsettia or poinsettia, tomato, tomato, potato, potato, I have no idea. Uh, but I'm sure it's poinsettia because that was what was repeated regularly enough. Um, so what we do each year as a part of the tradition is we actually buy poinsettias for $10. They become a part of the beauty of the Christmas experience here in church uh, and online, of course, and then they become yours. Often people will buy those as kind of a representation honoring people that they love or even people uh, that they have lost this year or in previous years. It's a beautiful way to remember family, community, and connection during Christmas. Final piece is December 5. December 5th, we have a drive-in movie around here. It's a Christmas movie. I don't exactly know what it is, but it will be fun. You want to bring family, hot chocolate, sit in your car. We have the screen. We actually have the ability to broadcast onto your radio. It's really fun. December 5th, look for the details on that. You will not want to miss out. Now, as we begin this morning, I'll just say to you, um, it's wonderful to move into Advent. And that Advent is a time when we regularly come together and prepare our hearts. One of the great traditions of the church is the Advent wreath. Uh, each candle having a different piece of our preparation toward Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. And we aren't going to be able to do it in the same way, having families come up and light these candles in that beautiful way that so many churches do. So we had an idea. How beautiful would it be, instead of lighting the candles on the altar here in the church, is if we imagined a kitchen table as the altar in all of our homes, which in so many ways, especially those of us that are online, it has become. And so the families that will be lighting the Advent wreath this year we're going to be doing it from their homes, and we're going to get a little invitation into a lot of people's uh, lives. And so let's begin our Advent by settling our hearts and beginning with this lighting this morning. Hi, welcome to our home. We're the Burke family. Come on in. We're glad you're here with us to light the first Advent candle. Journey begins with a choice. Shall I go or not? Shall I stay and embrace the known and the comfortable? Or shall I go and maybe find something wonderful? Or maybe unsettled, upset, and uncertain? Our Advent journey begins with rules of the road. We are on the way to where God would have us be, and we're not there yet. But how shall we go? We shall go together as one body, living and trusting in one another. We shall go as this community of faith, working side by side and leaning into the grace of God every step of the way. We shall go in peace. Isaiah says that in days to come, the nations shall stream to the mountain of the Lord, 
and there will be beat swords into plowshares and spears into printing huts. There we will learn war no more. God will teach us peace. We light this first candle to burn as a sign of peace among all people. Good job. Come, let us go up the, to the mountain of the Lord, that God may teach us the ways of peace. Come, come overcome, overcome Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Now let us prepare our hearts for worship as we say our prayer of unity. O oh God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus, your Son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love and work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth. That in your good time, all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Would you stand and worship with us? Come to the
You do it. 
they will know the Father's love. Will you join us in the prayer of repentance this morning? Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And we know that God is gracious to forgive us and to continue reconciling us to himself and to each other. You give life you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. So we pour out our 
watch your face. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. pray the words that God taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hey Amen. You guys can be seated. Give it up for the worship team. Two people. Man. Yeah. Just really moved. Um, well, we're so excited to see you all here today. And Merry Christmas. Yeah, okay. Well, apparently no one is jolly but me. Um, Merry Christmas. That was a bit better. That was a bit better, guys. I'm excited for Christmas year. I absolutely love Christmas. It's my favorite time uh, of year. It kind of serves as an anchoring point for me in the year, kind of reminding me of who I am, why I'm here, the love and the joy that comes out of this time I'm really grateful for. And so we're really excited to begin Advent um, this year. I just can't wait, especially this year. I just, man, it's Christmas time. I'm, it's going to go all out. Eggnog is flowing. Uh, it's going to be fantastic. So what we're going to do now is we're going to enter into a time of giving. And I just kind of want to encourage you guys today, uh, giving this time, maybe use this time over the next few weeks to remind yourself that this isn't just about giving financially, although it's a part of it, but giving uh, as a form of worship, whether that's finances, whether that's time, effort, whatever it is. I know for me over the course of the last few months, this time specifically, the time of offering has served as another one of those anchor points. And it has never done that before, before this pandemic. I don't know what it is about this pandemic, but this moment when I can get up, when I get up here and I start talking about offering, I have to think and pray about who we are and why we do what we do. And so it's served each week as we come up and we talk about enter into this time of giving. It's served as that anchoring point for me to remind me that I am a part of something that is God's transformative movement in the world. And so this season, especially over these next four weeks, as we enter into time, times of offering, I would encourage you guys to remember that this, this form of giving is a form of worship. And whether that is what we do with our money or what we do with our time or what we do with whatever it is, this is a, one of the ways in which we come together and we remind ourselves of who we are, of who we belong to, and of what we get to take a part in. So it's with that spirit, the Christmas spirit, if you will, um, that I say it is now time for the morning offering. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you so much for including us in what you're doing in the world. God, we thank you for Christmas. We thank you for eggnog. We thank you for lights. We thank you for all of it. Cookies. It's fantastic. The excuse to eat poorly. Um, we love you, and we're so excited to enter into this season where we remember you giving the ultimate gift, which is your own self, so that we not only can be transformed into who we always were meant to be, but that we actually can know you. How crazy is that? God, I pray for this time of giving of our finances or just giving in general, whether it's time, resources, whatever it is, Lord, I pray that you use what is given and multiply it in a way that we could never ask or imagine and so that we can see your kingdom moving forward with power and with love and with grace in a time when people may feel disconnected and alone. 
and all of those things might be magnified, God. We pray that your love like flows out of this place in a very powerful way. God, we love you. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Worship is an interesting thing. Giving our hearts fully over to something, freely. And really feeling freedom in that is what worship is all about. Christian worship, that's what we're always doing, is trying to find ways to give ourselves over fully to love, often in spaces like this. But worship doesn't really only exist in a place like that. Worship can be really anywhere. In fact, part of it could even be in a high school, just like this. Whether you went to this high school or went to another one, my imagination is that you remember your high school. And you're probably not thinking about this as a place that you could worship, but you could. You could bring the best of yourself to work, to friendship, to music, football, whatever it might be. If you're bringing your full heart on God's behalf, next thing you know, you're doing something more significant than you ever thought you would, even in high school. It could even be your profession, obviously, in a place like this where people are saving people's lives, people are being born, people are passing away, people that work here at every level, worship with everything that they've got. Those that are faithful are actually doing their very best to give glory to God in what they do, whether you're a lawyer, businessman, nurse, doctor, whatever it may be, that's who you are, that's what you do. One of my favorite places though is of course in nature, out of doors, kind of God's creation. It's really easy to feel I don't know, worshipful in a place like this, like grateful, like you can't believe you get to be in a part of stuff like this and you're a part of something bigger than yourself. A lot of people talk about how when they go out in nature, it's pretty easy to feel God's presence. And it seems like a early part of what it means to be, I don't know, a worshipful person. The other place could be really simple. Your own neighborhood, kind of in the everyday world of dogs that bark and neighbors are out for a walk. I mean, can we worship in places like this? Can they become places where it's a lifestyle that we fully worship all the time, everywhere we are, and that in doing that, love becomes the center of who we are. Freedom becomes the experience of what we do and everything that kind of comes with it. Come on in, this is my house. And I'll tell you that one of the things I do every morning As I start right about here, I turn on this light, I sit down, and I worship. Hey man, what a cool reminder uh, that we worship in every single part um, of our lives. And I don't know about you guys, but I do feel like that I need to explain the Shema walking now. So the Shema is a Hebrew prayer that comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6. But I, I love that video. I think it was so cool and what an excellent reminder. I began to think of the places in my own life that I go to and like what would it look like for me to worship at Thunderbird on Manor or whatever it is, these coffee shops that I, well, used to go to. Um, what are those places and what a cool reminder um, for that. So what we're going to do now is another reminder, another way in which we worship. And that's the say the Shema. And the Shema is a Hebrew prayer, like I said, that comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and a little bit in Leviticus. Jesus would have said it every morning and every evening and probably every midday. And so we say it just as a way to put Jesus' words on our lips. And I have to say, especially, this is a form of worship and it's one of my favorites. Because for me growing up, when I would do this in church, whether it was when I was in high school, I loved it because it was my excuse to, I'm a loud person. It was an excuse to yell in church, um, which is always fantastic. But as I've gotten older, what I've realized is this is a way in which we can worship with our grit, with our passion and with our fire because it's where that place lives in us. That's where the Shema comes out of. So when we say the Shema, we say it with strength because it is fueled by that grit and that fire that lives inside of us uh, for God's kingdom. So I'd encourage you to stand. Uh, We'll say it together. We'll say a little bit in phonetic Hebrew and we'll say the rest in English. And like I said, this comes from the deepest parts of who we are. So we say it with strength. Let's say it together. Shema Israel. Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, 
and love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Our scripture today comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 15. Let's read it together. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. These are the very words of God. You can be seated. I'm excited about this morning, actually. Uh, I always am somehow, but I'm regularly, I don't know, completely renewed by study and discovery. Uh, And this morning is no different. For Advent this year, we're going to be doing a thing called Christmas more than ever. And the idea of those that pray and imagine these things is that ultimately we need Christmas more than ever. And so um, Merry Christmas. I'm excited about that. But also just to let you know, those four candles uh, are going to have four different focus, foci, whatever that would be. The first is this, what we're talking about this morning, worshiping fully. What does it mean to worship fully? The second is going to be to spend less. Spend less money than maybe we would. Spend less time kind of wasted. Spend less. Make less so that week three, we can give more. We can actually let ourselves become something more. And the final and fourth piece is to love all. Love all. And so this picture of these four Sundays as we prepare our hearts, then if we are doing our best to position ourselves through the Holy Spirit and by our own intentions, that we'll be ready for that child to be born in the stories that get told on Christmas Eve and maybe even the ones that we tell in our homes throughout the season. This morning, worship fully. I grew up, as many of you know, in downtown Austin, Church First United Methodist Church. And so worship for me, I can remember really crystal clear as a boy. We sat always on the first row of the balcony on the left-hand side as you were facing the chancel, like perched little birds. And we were there every week as soon as we could right after the first hymn. Not sure how we were late to church then, especially because we had been there since seemed like the crack of dawn, but somehow we pulled that off and we would sit in the front. And what was powerful for me was the experience of worship. As a boy, what would happen? My memories are that the choir 
would come in from the back, just below us with the white and the red robes. They would move forward, split out at the front, and then go up to the top, filling in the choir seats that were in the front and the back of the chancel. The pastors coming, three or four, depending on who was there, and they're black with the clear pictures of the all the different stoles. They would fill in these massive seats. We would stand there, finish the hymn together in this massive swell of basically saying to God, ourselves, and the world, we have arrived for something sacred. We have arrived for something special. I always knew that as a kid. It was majestic. It was powerful. And it set me along this journey of discovery. And there were times when I would discover worship like that and I would be like very excited. And then there were times when it just started to fade and that started to not be a place that I could connect. There were two years where I was an agnostic at best and worship wasn't ever in church. It was in other places with other things that I was worshiping and those were destructive and it was a hard time. And then I remember uh, starting to come back. One of the things that was really funny is I went and visited my girlfriend, now wife's parents' church and they had drums in the worship and it was definitely not church. I was the only one in a suit and they all hugged me. It was terrible. It was very uncomfortable. But Along that arch and story of God helping me understand what worship really looked like, many of you know, one of the most powerful moments in my life was at a retreat weekend that's called Chrysalis, which is the youth or student version of a retreat weekend that many uh, folks know as the Emmaus, uh, going to uh, the weekend called Emmaus. Now, what that was is I got to be the pastor in charge, the spiritual director of the whole thing. And there were 30 or 40 guys uh, that were ranging in ages from about 15 to about 18 or 19. And we all had spent some good time together. It came to this evening, this particular evening, very powerful. We had experienced in a really unique way the power of God's tangible love. It overwhelmed all of us. A lot of kids had never experienced God's love before, were really just baked in it and were just weeping and moved. And we moved directly from there to this tiny little chapel around the corner and just had a quiet time, letting everybody sort of just, I don't know, take it in, come down off of it, whatever we do. We're supposed to be in there for a a short devotional time, which lasts half an hour, 45 minutes. And the adult types like me were managing that and trying to make sure that the boys were. And then there was this guy named Nick. He'd play the music for the whole weekend. But he stood up and walked over and sat on a little stool. Little guy. Very cool hair. And he just started playing worship songs, just trying to find ones that we knew. No big deal. Seen it a handful of times. But something happened in the room. There was this deep, profound, unifying swell that felt like God's presence itself came into the room. At first gentle and then undeniable. And soon 15 minutes had become 30, had become an hour, had become two And 15-year-old boys, 16, 17, 18, and even grown men found ourselves in this tiny chapel with their hands on the pew in front of us, beating the pew as we sang at the top of our voices, Lord, make us a generation. Make us a generation that changes the world. Make us a generation that, that fills the whole world with a radical love. We were free. We were undignified. We were way loud. We were completely out of control. It was raw, absolute power. And it was a miracle. And if you don't believe me, try to get a 15-year-old boy to sing a worship song out loud a little bit. 
try 40 at the top of their lungs and the adults in their room intimidated at the raw power of those boys. We were there almost three hours and it felt like 15 minutes. I was in charge and so I realized, oh, there is a little pizza party that has been quietly put together for us up on the hill by a bunch of moms. They were waiting for us two hours ago. We had better go. We go up there. I made the mistake of getting a little too close to a doorway and a mom's hand came out, grabbed me and I was into the door and then I was surrounded by these moms who were not sure what was going on. Where have you been? Which is something that I heard a lot in my life. So I was like fine with it. And I was looking at these moms and I'd just been in this amazing place and uh, they, they said, what happened? And I said, the Holy Spirit came and all of your boys have been singing at the top of their lungs for however long it's been. It's been two and a half, three hours. Really? Yeah. We could hear you all the way up here. I said, it was an amazing thing. And as I left the room, those moms gathered and began to worship themselves. I'll never forget it. It was this big, free, powerful, wondrous moment. It's interesting too, because that stuff gets weird, right? Because beating on pews, hands in the air, all this kind of stuff, it's super awkward and very undignified most of the time. And if you've ever been around those communities, <laughs> that's weird. Um, and, and I have been uh, quite a bit. Uh, in fact, uh, there was one community uh, long ago, really, that was really famous for a handful of things in that kind of charismatic, and what I mean by that, that big Holy Spirit-filled world. Uh, they were famous for a few things. One is they were nicknamed the Barking Dogs. You ever heard of that? Isn't that weird? Because literally when they would start speaking in tongues and singing, it would sound like dogs were barking. And so they were teased. I had a bunch of barking dogs, you know, and all this kind of stuff. They, that same group actually, in part of their tradition at one point, they, they act, had a rule that when you built a building, when you had the pews in space, there was a rule that there was an amount of space between the chancel and the first pew. And that was the length of a grown man laid down because so many people were going down in the spirit. And if you have never seen that, that's something. Going down in the spirit, laying down. So they wanted to make sure there was enough room so nobody hit their head. Okay? Crazy. All this other kind of stuff. It's just wild. What's interesting is that the, the kind of leader of that whole group, actually in his uh, diary, his journaling, he would write stuff like, Lord, bring revival, which is what they were seeing somehow. Bring revival, but don't bring it in the flesh. I love it because he was like a reluctant charismatic. He was like, I get it, this is happening, but this is freaking me out, man. You know, this is kind of what he's writing. This is super, super weird. By the way, then he wrote, but your will be done right after that, which is really cool. Weird to think about those kind of folks, right? Until you realize that the name of that group were the Methodist. And that that man was John Wesley. And what he wrote, one of the great quotes you'll find if you Google his name, and he'll say it better than me, but I'll paraphrase. He said, you know, my real fear is that this movement called Methodists would evaporate from the face of the earth, that they would stop worshiping, that they would just not be anymore. That's not my fear. John Wesley said, my greatest fear is that they would continue on but lose the power of the Holy Spirit as a recognizable, demonstratable part of their life. That they would have the form of worship, but not the power. Friends, our spiritual inheritance is the powerful worship of God filled with the Holy Spirit and the hope of the world. One of the things that happens 
It's interesting is because that stuff can be uncomfortable. I, I'm kind of like Wesley, at least in that one way. I, I'm a reluctant, charismatic. I believe in the Holy Spirit. There's some things you can't unsee, can't unknow. And if I would have only seen those boys and only had that one experience, I couldn't have done anything about it. It just would be so. And it is. But part of that is I heard a guy. He's actually a, a leader from uh, International House of Prayer. Uh, and it's powerful to think about what he says, what he says about uh, that place. The International House of Prayer, by the way, has been worshiping for 24 hours a day, seven days a week um, for almost 20 something years. It's amazing. You can go online and actually click into their chapel. It's really beautiful. I've been there too and everything else. Uh, Mike Bickles, I think the man's name, and he came out and he was talking about kind of all that expression in church, all that weirdness, people throwing up their hands and all this other, right? And so he said like, like what, what is that? And he said, a lot of people are saying that this is fake, right? And he said, well, let me tell you what. I would say, he said, and he wrote this and he spoke this. He said, um, 80, 8, 0, 80% of what you see on a Sunday morning is fake. Fake. And let me tell you what I mean by fake. He said, sometimes when people come into church, um, they've had the worst week of their life. And they don't feel like raising their hands. And they don't feel like singing the songs, but they do it anyway. They raise their hands. They sing their songs. And so if you think that they don't feel that way, they don't. And if that's the definition of fake, that's fake. He said there's also a group of people in here that has had this beautiful experience before, but they feel distant from God right now. They don't feel like God is there. So what they do is they try to do what they remember they try to go back to that place where God was real and beautiful and tangible and they want to experience all of that. But they're not necessarily feeling that now. They're trying to get somewhere. And if that's fake, then that's fake. Another group of people, like in any group of human beings, are trying to get attention. And there's a broken woundedness to that. And they're doing that to get attention. We know that. And that's fake. But we're really glad that they're here. And he goes on. He finished by saying, but let me tell you this. 20% of the people that are in here are experiencing the creator of the universe in a transformative way so deep that they couldn't even explain it to you. Nor would you want them to. They're being shaped and transformed by God here. And we'll be back every time to practice that. How amazing would it be to be a community with that kind of mature strength, fullness, and power? I wonder what that would look like here. Every part of the Christmas story what happens when there's an encounter with Jesus is that there is worship. Mary, you're going to have a baby. She worships. Joseph, in a dream, second time, this is what's going to happen. Worship. Over and over and over, there's worship. Even years later, when the Magi have chased the star, what do they do? They come and they worship. But you get to those seven, there's seven actual pieces of this worship. Uh, one of them is halal, right? Uh, seven Hebrew words that mean praise. Each of them is different. One of them actually means, to yada, it means throwing your hands up, praise like this. It's really funny, one of the most ancient images of praise in worship is with your hands up like this. I was at the back of a church one day and there was this lady, we were singing a hymn, very traditional church. She had her hands up, she was just singing. She was going at it. I was standing there with the ushers. One of the ushers said, that is awkward, right? And I was like, that is true. It is awkward and it's also true that that is the most ancient biblical expression of worship in this room, more than likely. Isn't that weird to have both of those things true at the same time, right? There's uh, another where it means like just literally to, to get onto your knees and praise God for all of his greatness, right? 
Like all these physical expressions of worship, one way or the other. It's really interesting too, because if you think about it, some of these things are actually natural to us. You already do these things. You already worship with your person. You just might not think of it that way. I was watching the uh, football game yesterday, and in case you're wondering, when I say the football game, my mind means the University of Texas. I'll tell you if I'm talking about another game. For instance, I'll watch Texas A&M this evening um, or yesterday night, whatever it was. <laughs> so here's this, this picture, right? I was watching the game, uh, and what I noticed was something that we all do. If you're sitting, you're at your team's game, you're sitting in the stands, right? And the running back breaks through the line, and you see daylight, and it is clear that everything could possibly mean that that guy's going to score. What happens? You fly up and your hands shoot up in the air. Yeah, yeah, we're going to score. And then it's like everybody's hugging and we don't even know each other. And there's fires all over the place. We're really excited, right? A natural human expression to give praise is hands all the way up in the air. Do any of you ever remember being trained to do this? Do any of you ever remember that? It, watch children. Woo! They're excited, right? This is what happens. Also, you can see how long my arms are. But it, like, this is a big deal, right? It's a natural thing. You praise. You're made for it. It's ancient. It's built into you. Why don't we praise here? Why don't we praise in our cars? Because we look undignified. We look ridiculous. We've grown up past that. Well, isn't that too bad? David actually brings right, the ark into Jerusalem, and he comes in, and all he's wearing is an ephod, which is basically jewelry. It's really embarrassing. It's really uncomfortable. His wife comes to him and says, this is not the behavior of a king. You're being undignified. You know what David says? I'm only getting started. I'm going to get a whole lot more undignified than this. I'm going to worship God until I reflect him. That's powerful. We're called to do the same thing. We're made to do the same thing. So here are the pieces. We worship with an open heart. Say open heart. Open heart. Good. See, here's the thing. You already know. You have a sense of your heart, whether it's open or not. Think of it this way. When you're fighting with your spouse, do you have an open heart to them? No. But when you make up and things are reconnected, one of the ways that you know that is that you open your heart. It's where that intimacy lives. How about your kids? When your children say or do something and they're angry and they, wow, it's the first thing that we do. We close our hearts. And you know when your kid's heart is closed to you. You know, the instant that it happens. Oh! Right? Parents do the same thing to kids too sometimes, don't we? Friends. Relationships. This open and closed heart thing sometimes is subconscious, but it's real. Who do you have a closed heart to right now? Does it include God? What would it look like to have an open heart? God's heart is always open. Our brokenness closes it from us, right? So here's that picture. Having an open heart. You know, we practice having an open heart. One of the ways, we come here. We come to worship in this place. We come to worship wherever we are online. We practice together. We remind each other. Which sometimes we need have an open heart. So the first way to worship fully is to have an open heart. The second way is to actually have a listening heart. We go in and we listen. We open up our heart. I'll tell you over and over and over. I come to church and I'm like, and I'm closed. I'm like, oh, I gotta open my heart. I don't want to, but I will. Whatever. And I'll get right here. And it's like, God's like, I got you. I love you. We're gonna be all right. And I often get reminded in a place that I don't ever get reminded. Sometimes I'll hear encouragement. Sometimes I'll hear clarity of vision and path. Whether that's here or whether that's in my office, at home, in the car, when I'm jogging. If I can open my heart and just listen, I can learn how to hear from God over and over and ask him to include me. 
which is really that last part, right? The part where we, we actually become different. Because here's the thing. You and I begin to look like whatever we worship. And as humans, we worship. You're going to worship something. You're going to worship at the football game. You're going to worship that. You're going to worship. It doesn't matter. Uh, watch political rallies. It's all, it's all the same. All the actions, all the physical actions are the same. Very interesting to study. But we're going to do this. The real issue isn't whether we're going to worship or not. The real issue is what do we worship? And we worship, whatever we worship, we become like. Which is why God is constantly saying in the Bible, worship only me. It sounds so self-focused when we hear him say that, right? But what he's really saying is, Worship, love, radical, unhindered, unbounded love. Worship who I am and how I am so that you'll be like it in the world. Bottom line, worshiping God means that we become more loving, capable, clear, passionate, fiery, intense, hope-filled, and hopeful. So that we're able to bring the kingdom in this world to take action, to be included in what God has to say so that our open hearts, worshiping fully, best we can, wherever we are in our life right then, can be poured out into the world that needs it the most. Final thing I'll tell you is this. We started a little guerrilla campaign. And what I mean by that is we're just kind of, I don't know, have you gotten the feeling that like all the kind of toxic stuff that's in the world is just tired of it? I'm tired of it. It's just super tiring. And at the same time, have you felt like, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know. I don't know what to actually do about it. I want to do something. You know, I've, had imagined, I've imagined myself on TV. If I could just say a series of the right thing, no. You know, like whatever. It just gets ridiculous in your mind uh, to figure out what. So we decided, you know what usually crosses lines through, I don't know, words, ideas, ideals, religion, all of it, right? Is art and music and images like that. So that what if we took beauty into hard places, light into the dark? What if we did that? I'm like, that's a really good idea. So three or four of us decided to do this. So this last week, we, you'll, you'll see this soon. We, we did capture a little of it. But we hope to make this more of a movement and invite you to do the same. Uh, it's called Spread Joy. We called our friend, uh, his name is Sean Riley. Anybody know who Sean Riley is by chance? Yeah, some of you know. If you don't know who Sean Riley is, he's one of the nation's most unbelievable violinist. Like, it's astonishing what this guy could do. Uh, he's at the University of Texas. He actually 3D printed a six-string violin that you can play. Then he plays all these crazy, like, I don't know. It's amazing if you want to go look up Sean Riley, right? He's an incredible guy. And so what we did was we called Sean because he is a follower of Jesus, a disciple. And we were like, hey, this is our idea. What we'd like to do is this pushback thing. He's like, okay, what do you have in mind? He goes, well, we said, well, we know that there has been a lot of violence and difficulty down at this one feeding uh, location, one of these places that gives out food every uh, day to a homeless uh, community that's down off Cesar Chavez, and they've just, all kinds of stuff's going on. It's a really hard thing. To, it's just hard. Everything's hard. So what we were thinking is, what if you went down there and played the violin while they were getting food? Like you just played music for the folks that were in line to get their food for the day, the soup and the bag of stuff that they get. Like, what do you think? You know what he said? He goes, I'll be early. So we did this Monday. We went down to the program, which is epic, and you should know about it. Go look at it. Austin Baptist Chapel and Cesar Chavez, they feed folks almost every day. We got there. The cops had already been there that morning, chatted with them. We lined up around the corner, people with all kinds of reasons to be there. Not sure of us. How do they trust us, the do-gooders that have shown up, right? We're not asking anything of them. 
Here's the powerful thing. Sean starts playing. And this epic stuff, craziness coming out of him. And I'm standing two or three feet away, mostly because his violin was worth almost $300,000, which made me super nervous. Somehow I was the security, by the way. You can laugh about that later. Or now it's fine. (laughs) What I noticed, though, is I just, it was okay. Blew all of that off. We started having conversations, hearing stories. Happy Thanksgiving. What's going on? Got to know some people. All the time he's playing beautifully. Soaring music. But there was a moment amongst all of this that I looked back over my shoulder and I saw him in the dirt in between the sidewalk and the street as the city buses passed us and the, and the wind pushed us toward our new friends where the hairs on the bow were beginning to fray and fly apart. His eyes were closed tight. And he was playing as if there were 10,000 fancy people or a king in front of him. Because in some ways there were. And the look on his face, to me, was a reflection of the king he worshipped. I want to look like that. And so I'll keep practicing so that I can worship fully the king. Will you join me? Join me as we pray. Father in heaven, I'm grateful for all that you are and all that you do. I'd ask now that as we just ask for our hearts to be shaped and made open, that we would find in ourselves this listening ear to what you would have for us, that you would fuel us with your spirit, keeping that practice of your presence right in front of us so that we might pour that out on the world, wherever we may be. We ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Two quick things. One is, birthdays. Does anybody have a birthday? We always love to have a little community time right after the message. Does anybody have a birthday coming up this next week? We could just pray a blessing over you today. Oh, there's a one right over there. What's her name? I can't, I can't hear. Somebody help me out. Today's her birthday? Oh, beautiful. So tell me her name real loud because I can't. Say it again. Mikey? Hey, Mikey. Hi, Mikey. How are you? Happy birthday. I think it'd be really fun if we just said a prayer for Mikey. And also, Mr. Williams there. Pam Williams is having a birthday tomorrow. And also, one more over here. Wait, who are? Yesterday, a birthday. That's right. It's beautiful. I love that she's holding up your arm. Yeah, that's, that's hilarious. That's beautiful. Oh, and the fighting and the pointing. A birthday this week. When? She's being dramatic. That's her job. Uh, Because I'm going to tell you what. You know what was dramatic? When she delivered you. That was dramatic. So how about we give her a little break? How about we do that one? That'd be good. Um, So a birthday. That's right. So when is it? December 12th. It's coming. So you won't be here. Is that what we need to do? Ah, see, she's being sweet. Also, it feels like there's another birthday. Our, Our oldest, her older brother, Ryan, turns 21 tomorrow. So... Yeah, that's right. He's, that's right. We raised him, and he's 21 whole years. It was amazing. He said, so let's pray for Mikey and just everybody this morning. So, Father, we are grateful for all these birthdays, for these lives. We ask that you would bless them with another year of joy. They bring us so much. Would you bring them joy? Uh, we ask a blessing for each and every person that gets celebrated from our community and birthdays uh, this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Last one is anniversaries. Anybody have any anniversaries? Uh, when is y'all's anniversary? Is it coming up in the next year? 
because your daughter cannot point at you. Because, oh, yeah, they're having a birthday. They're having an anniversary in June. I won't be here. So, yeah, <laughs> you always get them back. Anybody have an anniversary coming in the next seven days or so? Another oh, a birthday we missed. Well, sorry about that. Uh, you can be counted in because God is not connected by time. So we'll just rope you in that way. Anybody have an anniversary? Awesome. Let's pray and celebrate this meal because the great thing is we celebrate Jesus and each other as we gather around once again uh, the meal of the Lord. If you brought your communion elements, this would be the time here in church that you could bring those out. And if you have them at home, this is the moment that we gather together even though we're apart. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. On that same night after the meal, he lifted the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. It's the cup of my blood poured out for forgiveness, poured out for you. He asked us to eat this bread and drink this cup. And that when we would do that, we would remember him. And so, Father, we would ask that wherever we are and whatever we do, as parents, as friends, as employees, as employers, as leaders, as followers, all of it would be a worshipful day for, for giving you the practice of your presence. We ask all of that as we receive these by your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. So we take the bread and together we eat. and the cup. And once again, we are gathered. Even though we're apart. And so, Father, we lift up this time now out of celebration and hope. Help us to rise to worship with strength and with a story to tell. In Jesus' name. Would you stand as we sing the doxology together? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Praise God for all that He has done. Praise Him for He has overcome the grave. God, our Savior, Christ the Son, and Amen, and Amen, and Amen. God, we praise you. God, we praise you. pivot in the holiday week and we are so grateful for your presence with us. Um, Thank you really in a very deep and profound way. 
Also, just to let you know, as we move out into this week, there's going to be lots of things uh, online, Pepper and all the social media. We're having a lot of fun during this season. Uh, look for that. Happy birthday, Mikey, uh, and everything that comes with it. Would you uh, just receive this blessing as you go? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. Have a great week. Yeah.